fans, welcome back to Room 237, and I'm back with another review. And this time I'm going back to Italy for a movie that, uh, it wasn't too recently that I picked this up, but it was fairly recently. And it's one I've been meaning to get to, and a couple of times I actually even forgot I had it. But um, it's one I wanted to get even way back when I did my first um, Italian horror film marathon. And this is the directorial debut of Lamberto Bava, son of the legendary, the great Mario Bava. That's 1980s uh, Macabre, or Macabro, also known as Frozen Terror. Uh, so yeah, this came out a year after his father's final film, um, Shock, which... Uh, depending on who you talk to depends on how much Mario shot, how much Lamberto shot. But there's actually, a, um, I guess the core of the story is quite similar to Shock, actually. And this is, it only feels more like a psychological horror film and sort of told through the, perspec through, through the perspective of... Um, a blind character which I thought was very interesting but and, and yeah this is the blue underground release I do believe there's an arrow one but I'm not entirely sure I'm a big fan of these blue underground uh, releases most of my Italian films are um, this kind of has like a Fargo opening where it says the following events are based on real events that happened in uh, New Orleans there's not much that can be found on that. Um, supposedly, I think it's on the commentary, Bava does state it's based on a very small, short news clipping about a woman that was found with, you know, keeping the twist ending that you see in this, which I'll get to. And that's actually how the film was given to him. Because at this point, he had worked as an assistant for his father, for Argento, for Diodato, for Joe D'Amato. And when he was called into the office, he thought he was going to be presented with another opportunity to assist another director. And he was given a, uh, I don't know, I think he was given the newspaper clipping or the idea of make a movie based on this. It is an entire work of fiction, but... I guess the extent of the true story aspect is sort of, I, I guess the whole crux of the story of what the main character Robert finds in this. You know, well, once she kept a lover on the side, but that's nothing compared to what she's keeping in the freezer. That's kind of the extent of what the, uh, real life event that it's based on. Now, it stars a few familiar faces. It stars uh, uh, Bernice Stegers, who was an extra, which I have not reviewed, but also uh, Stanko Molnar, who would go on to appear in Lamberto Bava's A Blade in the Dark, which I might re-review in the future because I don't remember being very lenient on that. Uh, I think I did a rant on it. I, I liked this a lot more than Blade in the Dark. And this is not a uh, Jallo at all. It's not as fun as Lamberto's Demons. The, the films of Bobas that I've seen and reviewed are all very different. One's a Jallo. One is just an over-the-top, fun, sort of zombie, done-by-demonic-possession film. And then this, which is like a real... It almost, fe it almost feels like an Italian version of like a Polanski film. And I mean that in a, in a good way. Because <laughs> it tells the story of this woman, uh, Jane Baker, who kind of wealthy woman she she has this lover named Fred where they uh, commit their affair in this rented room of this other wealthy person whose mother owns the house and that's 
character's named Robert Duvall, so there's that. He's one played by Molnar. That's definitely the best performance of the whole movie. But, uh, yeah, it, it, like, a, he's playing a blind guy that's a brass musical instrument repairman. And he plays blind very well, you know, the way he keeps his eyes, his head, his body language, his performance in general. It kind of reminds me of, like, a like a 1980 young Italian version of, like, a Joaquin Phoenix. <clears throat> but his mother owns the house and takes care of him. So this Miss Baker and this Fred guy, they rent a room from them, this mansion, or big house. That's where they commit their affair. She leaves her two young children unattended or attended more so by like the uh, garden keeper, I guess. And the daughter ends up drowning the son in the bathtub. She's probably 10 or 11. He's probably between five and seven, maybe. So she drowns him in the tub and the movie doesn't really go into why she did that or why she has this kind of disturbing or why she's so disturbed. But she really reminded me of the sister in Alice Sweet Alice. Just you you look at her and you can see the psychotic cunning turning and you want a comeuppance. Spoiler alert. There is some in this, unlike Alice, Sweet Alice, where I wanted to see something happen to that fucking kid. But while they're having their affair, there's a phone call. She's alerted that her son has accident accidentally died, that's what she believes, in the bathtub. So she has Fred race her back home, and in the panic, there's this accident where the car veers off the road, hits a guardrail... Guardrail goes through the windshield and decapitates Fred all in the same day. So then we jump a year later and we find out that Jane Baker has been in a uh, mental hospital for the past year. Her husband has pretty much written her off, ex-husband now, uh, refused to let her live with him in their home, really see their daughter, even though their daughter goes there from time to time. More often this film goes on. So she opts to stay with this blind guy, Robert, who has these lustful feelings for her. Like when she comes back, you know, he's very excited. He tries to tend to her, but she's very secretive, staying in her own room. His mother has passed on in, in the last year. So he lives by himself, and another part of his character is he's very lonely. He's got this very sort of, I don't know if he's pathetically innocent or innocently pathetic kind of look to him. Very sympathetic character. He's a very sympathetic character with a very good performance by Molnar. It, it is one of the stronger performances I've seen in an Italian film like this in quite some time. I actually really enjoyed watching him. So, you know, he's kind of let the house go to hell, but he's kind of picking up, you know, he shaves. He also kind of reminded me of like a Cillian Murphy, like Cillian Murphy and Walking Phoenix kind of put together. He shaves, he dresses up, he tries to, you know, invite her to dinner, kind of Norman Bates style. She, she refuses. In her room, she has this shrine made up for Fred. You know, this big triangle fold out thing with pictures, with like a bloody dollar bill from his pocket, cigarette butts, other things he had. And she has this uh, mini fridge with a freezer that she keeps locked. And that's pretty much the linchpin to the whole film. And a very interesting aspect about this movie is even though it makes Baker out to be the main character, we really discover the events through Robert. And since he's blind, we kind of go through it with him, which I think is a very interesting aspect because, you know, as she sets up the shrine and lights candles, she's in her, you know, uh, 
sexy nightgown. She's laying provocatively on the bed, kind of looking at his shrine, uh, moaning erotically. And then all of a sudden we hear like footsteps. Well, first we see Robert kind of laying in bed and he, I mean, we can tell he feels bad. He's upset because, you know, to his knowledge, someone's up there pleasuring her. And even in the beginning when Fred was still alive and they were having their affair, he's trying to uh, repair this trumpet, but it's getting more and more frustrated because he can hear them. So then we get these footsteps through the kitchen and up, up the stairs and we see her hear the footsteps. Her, I think it's a bathroom, falls off a hanger onto the floor, signifying someone's there. As the movie goes on, Robert's trying to figure out who else is here, essentially. And the similarity to Mario Bava's shock, which came out the year before, Mario's last film, Lamberto's first film, is is this woman seriously disturbed? Like, does she have some mental problems? She does, but is that what's going on? Or is there some supernatural thing going on? So I, I liked that as well. Um, it does kind of feel like two uh, plot devices are going on. Like, okay, this blind guy's trying to figure out what's going on with this woman. That one, I'm lustful after. Two, someone is pleasuring her at night, even though there's no one here. What is going on in my house, in her room? And then two, this woman that lost her son and lover in an accident, yet she still lusts and longs for him and is getting pleasure somehow with some sort of force that's coming in, some sort of unseen force. But is it all in her head? Is it supernatural? So you have these two things going on. And I went into this movie pretty blind as well. So I was really kind of... I, I was kind of living through this through Robert as well. Because I didn't really know much about this movie. I, I just kind of read the short synopsis that I read earlier about, you know, nothing compared to what she keeps in the freezer. I kind of had an idea, but... I figured there's gonna be more to it. And so I'm gonna get into spoilers now. <clears throat> but uh, before I do, I highly recommend this. If you really like more like the slower, it is slow paced, it is. It's more methodical. It's not slow like it's dragging. It, you can definitely feel there's a build to something. But it does have that sort of Polanski kind of story feel atmosphere but also done entirely through you know the styles of Italian filmmaking and someone like Lamberto Bava so I definitely recommend it it's not going to be something over the top fun like Demons um, it's a very interesting film um, if if you liked Shock, you'll probably like this. I actually like this more than Shock, to be honest. But, so, I, I definitely recommend it. And if you're just an Italian horror fan in general, then definitely check it out, because it, it definitely is worth it. So, spoilers. Uh, you know, at, at one point, Robert's able to get into her room, and there are some times where we see her laying in bed after the pleasure and we see like a, a bit of hair like kind of in the shape of a head like someone's laying there on the pillow which also that shrine has like a lock of his hair on it but Robert does eventually find in the bed this hunk of rotted skin with a ring in it it's an ear a uh, pierced earlobe which he sets aside and that's kind of his inclination that something's wrong the daughter Lucy keeps showing up from time to time, and her dubbed actress sounds a lot older than she looks, <clears throat> unless it is the same actress, but 
you know, eventually Robert is able to get into the room. Of course, he has the key. He's able to pick the lock in the freezer, finds out it's Fred's head, and he slyly gives Lucy this note that says, urgent, I need to speak to your father. He gives her a note under the guise of, you know, stop off at this hobby shop, pick me up some of this paint, because her and Baker are going into town. So he's able to get on the phone with the ex-husband, who doesn't believe her. The daughter is able to get into the freezer, finds that it's the head, and has some sort of plan on her own. Uh, you know, she tries to tell Robert no one's going to believe you. And we get the idea that she is kind of obsessed with her mother. Like, maybe she killed the brother Michael for attention. Like, so that I'm the only child. And then when she sees her mother for the first time, she's like, you know, drowning her in affection. And she takes the head out and hides it. But then... You know, Robert presents her with the pierced earlobe, and he's like, if that's not a head up there, then what's this? And you can kind of see... This is probably my favorite part with Lucy, other than the comeuppance, which is when you kind of see that look of, I gotcha, no one's gonna believe you, to... Oh, fuck. I didn't figure that out. It's a mixture of, like, a psycho being outwitted and just a child not getting what they want, <laughs> especially, like, a psychotic child. So then the three of them are having dinner together and Jane goes to take a sip of her soup and the earlobe is in there that Lucy was able to get a hold of and put in there and she just gives her this evil smile as Baker looks at her. So she runs upstairs to the bathroom and then that's when Lucy says, you know, everyone in town knows about the head Robert told Dad, everyone knows. Uh, now I can confess to you what I did to Michael because no one's going to believe you. And she's proud of it. Which, this is the only time Michael is mentioned since the beginning of the film. So, I mean, the, the movie doesn't do a very good job at explaining why she's this psycho little bitch. I've said before, I like it when movies don't spoon feed you. But, and have a little bit of ambiguity, but I would like it to lead to something. And, you know, now she almost seems glad that the mother's going to be put away forever. And then when she confesses, you know, finally she gets her comeuppance where Jane strangles her, then puts her in the tub, holds her under, she dies. Robert hears the commotion. He goes up, but he gets knocked down the stairs by Jane, who's now descended into a complete psychotic episode. You know, she's running through the house, laughing, cackling. She uh, she gives a pretty good performance as well, especially during this final act when her mind has just is just broken. Locks the door takes the head out and we do get the scene where you know she, she is making out with this rotted head and they did do some good detail on that i mean there's a lot of discoloration all hardened and shiny like it's been in the freezer even the viscera around the wound there's like this putrid looking green like it's starting to rot so we we get her making out with that which is awesome um, oh, it was also the, at one point, uh, I did forget to mention, Lucy drops by to put a present in her mother's room, one of the first times she shows up, and it's a picture of Michael, so he was kind of, in, and then the music kind of picks up at that point. I do like the score, it's very seldom, it is when something like when she puts the picture of Michael on her table or when Robert finds the earlobe and then when everything's coming up. Um, Robert's woken up by the water from the tub flowing down the stairs. 
And this is while she's making up with the head. And uh, Robert comes in, and then Jane, Jane kind of attacks him. They, they end up in the kitchen. There's this fight. The oven is open and red hot. And in self-defense, he pushes her head in it. Get, get some nice burn effects on the face. Like, pushes her head down on the burners. Which, I guess, kills her. Um, so then, Robert's making his way through the house, calling for Lucy. Doesn't know she's dead. And then we get the... We, I guess we get the answer of what's been going on this whole movie. In the very last shot, and in tradition of Italian horror films, this movie just ends. Because he's feeling around, he, he's calling for Lucy, he's on the bed, Fred's head is there, and just as he leans over, the head just comes up and bites him. Scream, frame, freeze frame. And end of the movie. So it's okay, I guess it was supernatural. She wasn't just masturbating and sort of having these delusions that she was being pleasured. I guess the footsteps, I mean, maybe she needed the head and the lock of hair and everything else and his spirit was there, but at least, you know, having sex with her, but at least his head was still there and alive, I guess. It also takes place in New Orleans, so there's probably some, maybe that shrine had a lot to do with like voodoo. But, so yeah, it, it gives us a bit of an answer at the end, but like a lot of Italian films, it just fucking ends. But for a first time director, and I mean, at least solo, because he's assist, he's been an assistant director on a number of films, especially with his father. Uh, he directed a lot of shock. But this might be my favorite Lamberto Bava film that I've seen so far. I do like it more than Blade in the Dark. Demons, uh, that I don't know about. Demons is really fun, but that's a you know that's the total opposite of what this is. But I like the atmosphere of this. You know, it's this creepy, kind of tacky, old, not really Victorian. The inside kind of feels Victorian. It's it, it the house has like this Bates house kind of look to it, especially with the furniture. And so it's got that good atmosphere. The way the music is very kind of, you know, it it swells and gets sweet during the erotic moments. It gets really, you know, kind of uh, Bernard Herman when the creepy, scarier moments are happening. But it all feels like a buildup, you know, with the drowning of the kid, the car accident, the girl leaving the picture, the finding of the earlobe, the finding of the head. It's all a buildup to something, and it does have a good pace. It is slower, but um, especially going into this blind, I it kept me enough to want to see where it was going. And I actually really like this story. And I also like the idea of sort of revealing everything to us bit by bit through Robert. Like we find out more about what's going on because of Robert. So it's like, we're going into a blind with him. So I really like that aspect as well. This is one of the better Italian films I've seen especially since I did my first marathon or I've really only done one marathon but of the ones I've done here and there since this is one of the better ones and I I really enjoyed this film loved the story loved it, it did have a good atmosphere I really like the performances of the two leads uh, uh Bernice Stegers and Stanko Molnar, they both did an awesome job, you know, uh, Stegers, Stegers, however you pronounce it, she, the way she has like her face sometimes, you can really tell she's hanging on and trying to keep her grip on reality and maintain a facade of normality, 
and Molnar just did a wonderful job playing blind. Like, I forgot he was in Blade in the Dark, so I actually had to look up if he was blind. But, you know, he, he was, he did great with that. But also just playing this lonely, pathetic, but also very sympathetic and innocent character. That really did remind me of like a Cillian Murphy or like a Joaquin Phoenix. And, you know, a, a guy that you enjoy going through this story with. So, yeah, I, for a first for a day a solo debut film uh, as a director very solid i really enjoyed macabre but yeah so there's that and i'm not sure what my next review or number of reviews will be i will be getting the dexter at some point i still gotta set everything up but as always uh thank you for watching oh, oh.